If you look at Revelation chapter 3, notice that he speaks to the church of Laodicea. In verse 17, Revelation 3, 17, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable, and poor and blind and naked. I counsel thee to buy of me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich, and white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed, and that the shame of thy nakedness do not appear, and anoint thine eyes with eye salve, that thou mayest see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. If they repent, notice God says in 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Notice that he invites this person that if they would be able to repent and open the door, then God can bring some kind of great revival in that person's life. Now, the great revival is described in Philadelphia, right? In verse 7, in verse 7. And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. God can flood in a revival that no one can stop, and the mighty power of God can move. Now I want you to remember these verses because it's going to match with the historical timeline of what these particular people went through. Now, fresh review. Remember that the pilgrims, they've landed in Plymouth, Massachusetts. The odds of this happening is incredible because if you recall, the Catholics and then the English Anglican Church where the Puritans came out, they were conquering and settling parts in the New World. However, America's be successful beginning did not start with those English or Catholic European settlements. It officially started with nothing Catholic or Calvinist. It started with something that is very close to a Baptist ideology. Now, have I, now as I've told you before, pilgrims are not labeled Baptist, and maybe there are some things that they lean towards similarly with the Puritans who were of a, more of a Calvinist type of belief. However, when you look at the pilgrims' mindset and their practice when they started America, you can see it matched very well with the Baptists, which is why the Baptists came flooding in over there. Because originally, it was started as the big key, the big key that everyone's got to realize is separation of church and state. Yeah. That is one of the most important things of Baptist distinctives. Right. So Calvin didn't have that. Remember when Calvinism started and John Calvin started everything, they're a mindset of church and state mixture. And Puritans, they thought that they could purify the church from within, which is tied to the state, which is why Baptist history is very important. You can see Baptist ideology, Baptist distinctives in the birth of a very great nation, what the Lord was going to do. So the odds of the pilgrim landing there without any Calvinist or Catholic uh, infiltration from the explorers is incredible, number one. Yeah. Number two, the place where they landed is incredible, where the native tribe made peace talks with them rather than attacking them. Because the pilgrims, they were a, they were a fragile bunch, and they could have died out real easily, but the native tribe that they confronted was actually a peaceful tribe. Now, the Smithsonian Magazine and liberals and woke people, they would like to uh, sully Thanksgiving, and they would claim, no, when the whites came here, it's not like the uh, natives were peaceful with them and they all got along, because the natives, the reason why that they were able, to, that they did peace talks once the pilgrims came in is because they were at war with other fellow native tribes. So they want to side in with the pilgrims yep. so that they can get some kind of, um, they can get uh, more support. Well, you know, that's just liberal garbage. Fine, how do you do? You just basically supported our statement that, yeah, they were in peace. What are the odds of that? Yeah. They could have just been at war with those pilgrims. And what are the odds of that happening where they can have a successful civilization after that? See, so they only just support our history. 
They just want to find ways to go around it. Yeah. That's it. Anyways, they're also going to tell you revisionist history, false history, liberal woke uh, brainwashing of history. They're also going to claim that it wasn't a, a happy meal or Thanksgiving. It was actually where the white people came in and start to slaughter a bunch of native tribes after that. They didn't have a happy Thanksgiving. Well, they were fast forwarding your history. Yeah. They have to admit that the, uh, that the pilgrims, they did hold a peaceful meal together with the native tribes. And as a matter of fact, they even held a second peaceful meal after that. And I've told you about that second peaceful meal, which is even more incredible that the liberal media won't tell you. They just like to fast forward, you know, a couple of years later or uh, like scores of years later where the whites start to slaughter the native tribes. We'll come to that later, okay? But they don't tell you what happened at that particular event, all the details. You notice that? You know why? Because if they tell you all the details what happened, they're forced to tell you what Christian practices they did yeah. or how successful they became. So that's just revisionist history. Bunch of garbage. Anyways, the second Thanksgiving feast that they held together was incredibly was even more successful because as I've told you before, it was at that time the first Thanksgiving feast, they had a lot of help from the native tribe. And with the odds of Squanto over there speaking English, and also with uh, the, tr the chief leader of that native tribe, where he was able to uh, do peace talks with them and helped out the pilgrims in their first Thanksgiving, in their plantation, being able to enjoy a good meal. But the second Thanksgiving feast, the pilgrims were the ones who outnumbered the meal and the flourishing than the native tribes. Why? Because this time they said, we got to go to church. We got to pray. That's the reason why we suffered a lot in uh, planting our crops and having a successful civilization. And after they did that, the Lord just blessed their crop, their harvest, and they had more than the natives. And then the natives, when they came in, they were impressed and they even spoke positively of their religion and God. And by the way, they became God-fearing. These native tribes, they may not have all became saved Christians, but some of them converted to Christianity and a lot of them became God-fearing, which the schools won't tell you. They dropped those details. But I'll tell you some parts of that as we go down to our history and you'll find it interesting. Now, uh, whether they held it on exactly Thanksgiving Day of November, I cannot tell you. But the point is around that time of harvest where they held a meal, that is a historical fact that they did hold a peaceful meal together with the native tribes and even a second one, which was even better. And that was God's hand behind it, which they won't tell you. Now that you understand that, remember that the Baptists started to flood into America. When they start to also flood into America because of the pilgrims, what they started, remember the Puritans also followed along. So there were Puritans and then the Baptists who came in. The Puritans were the ones who were more wealthy, obviously, more educated, obviously, more backing, obviously. And remember, they had ties to the Anglican church. So because of that, that's why the Puritans, they were able to start to make settlements uh, throughout, the, uh, throughout the colonies, and this is what is known in history as the 13 colonies as time passed by. But the pilgrims were the ones that was the, we can officially say, we can officially say was the most successful start. And because of them, that's the reason why all the other people, when they start to make settlements and then come in, it start to build up one by one. Remember, before the pilgrims, they didn't really have successful settlements. They always died out. Yeah. Remember, Sir Francis Bacon connected to globalists. They even tried to start something, but the Lord just made sure that they were wiped out, that that didn't, uh, that that didn't happen. The pilgrims were the ones who started. So because of their success, other people start to come in and they start to find some success in building a civilization. So one by one, Japheth was increasing and start to settle down 
in the new world in America. The Baptists who came in, obviously, they didn't like the Puritans, their ways of how they ran civilization, their way of running things. And as I've told you before, several cases of Baptists where they stood their ground, they didn't follow the program, the Calvinists, the Puritans program, so they've been persecuted for that. They've been fined for that. They've been criticized for that. I've given you several stories. Now I'm going to give you some names here, some heroes. One of them is Roger Williams. Roger Williams, he is credited for starting the first Baptist church in America. In reality, however, he is not, believe it or not. He is not. There's another person whose name should be mentioned, but we will come to him later. For Roger Williams, Dr. Samuel Adlam, who is Rhode Island's premier historian, so he's an authority that you should hear because Roger Williams, when he started his own settlement and he started to run things and he got the charter to be in charge and to take care of things and was credited with the First Baptist Church, a Rhode Island's, a Rhode Island's pre premier historian, Dr. Samuel Adlam, actually said this, it is greatly to be regretted that it ever entered into the mind of anyone to make him, Roger Williams, a Baptist or the founder of our denomination in Rhode Island or America. In no sense was he so. A man only four months a Baptist and only attempting to become one at that and then renouncing his baptism forever to be lauded and magnified as a founder of the Bapti Baptist denomination in the new world is simply absurd. For all he did as a statesman to aid our brethren in the, or advocacy of the separation of church and state, I respect him, but as a Baptist, I owe him nothing. So we have to understand that Roger Williams, we can put him as part of our Baptist history, so to speak, where he was paving a way for a lot of Baptist distinctives but to officially recognize him with the denomination of Baptist is sketchy to be at best, sketchy at best. So we have to realize that Roger Williams to be labeled as the founder of the first Baptist church in America is not really a credible thing to say. So we will come to who is later on. But there are some good things that we can say about Roger Williams. There is no doubt he's like a Baptist mindset. Yeah. The Baptist mindset, which is so important to understand, which is why Baptist, current Baptist denominations today have fallen away, is an independent mindset. That's very important. A church is an independent thing. If separation of church and state is so important that church independent from the state, then shouldn't, shouldn't it also be important that the local church is independent as well? So that's the reason why we are an independent Baptist church. We're not part of uh, other Baptist denominations. There are tons of Baptist, different Baptist denominations. But you'll notice they're tied to some kind of organization. See, enslaved to somebody else's, some committee, some opinion. No, we only go by the scripture. The scriptural thing is the person that's uh, in charge of the local church is the pastor. The only two offices are pastors and deacons. If it gets bigger, the local church, sure, you can have um, what you have is sub-pastors, so to speak. There are senior pastor versus junior pastors, deacons or assistant pastors. But the point is, nevertheless, is there is a pastor. There is not like some kind of grand committee over that or some kind of Vatican or some kind of pope over it. Amen. Capiche? Okay. So the thing is, that's why... That's an important Baptist distinctive that we take after, that a lot of modern Baptist churches aren't doing. So Roger Williams, that type of mindset, he's very independent. Now, doesn't this sound like a typical Bible-believing Baptist? When you're very independent and the scripture is your final authority, what happens is you become so independent that you're pretty much a rebel and you don't understand people and you can uh, preach and teach about the most incredible things that might sound like, yeah, that sounds spiritually good, 
But it's not ideal when you are in charge of people because right. they're not going to follow your spiritual conviction no matter how noble your spiritual conviction is. So Roger Williams, <laughs> funny guy, okay? Some things you can say amen, some things you might just laugh and say that's a little extreme. But either or, I'm happy to mention him as one of the things in Baptist history. So Roger Williams, he basically gave the, his, uh, the fellow Puritans and other people a hard time where he was saying, you know, we got to repent to God for uh, about ties to the Anglican church. But... This is even more extreme. He also said, we have to repent ourselves that we, uh, Lord, I repent that I was, I used to be an Anglican. Even though you're not an Anglican now, you, sh you have to repent for where you used to be an Anglican church member. So he was such a controversial pe person. He was very, uh, he was a very colorful, dramatic preacher too. See, it matches well with our Baptist history when you think about J. Frank Norris or you think about Peter Ruckman and uh, Martin Luther, who sadly wasn't a Baptist. But you can see that Bible-believing mentality, right? So he was a colorful preacher, dramatic preacher. So he was causing a ruckus. And obviously, nobody wanted to, uh, the Puritans didn't want to listen to this guy. So Roger Williams was kicked out, sent away. And so he's like, fine, and you know, I'm going to start something else. You know where he went to? The Pilgrims. So he went to the Pilgrims at Plymouth. So he decided to become their pastor. Why? You can find, uh, obviously over there, he can find more similarity. He can find more consolation, more agreement with them. Because the Puritan, they're that, uh, they're that stuffed shirt that really didn't share a lot with Baptist ideology compared to what the, uh, the pilgrims were practicing. However, Roger Williams was uh, so controversial that even the pilgrims couldn't withstand this guy. <laughs> so the pilgrims couldn't withstand this guy. And uh, like I told you before, pilgrims, they're not completely Baptist, like I told you, right? Or they're Baptist by denomination, even though some, their practice we can empathize with. So Roger Williams, he just couldn't find a place, so then he ended up in Rhode Island. So you ever wondered why he ended up in the smallest state of the United States of America is because that's how much of a controversial guy he is, all right? So he had to go in the smallest states of America, which is Rhode Island, and then start something himself. Roger Williams, when he uh, started something over there himself, he got the charter. So charters, for some of you who don't know, those are, things are very important because remember, England, they're colonizing the New World. If these people who came from England uh, moved to America, they can't just start something by themselves. No, uh, England has to keep tabs on them, which is why you're going to understand the American Revolutionary War later on, okay, because of that uh, connection to England. But anyway, before we rush ahead, so Roger Williams was able to get a charter. When you become a leader... When you take care of people, and you Bible believers know this to be true, with all that knowledge that you studied and you had your own spiritual conviction, once you start to take care of people, then you realize, look, I got to calm down. Yeah. And you become more patient and loving. As a matter of fact, he, became, uh, he was still tied and friends with William Bradford. And remember, William Bradford was the one who uh, was one of the leaders helping out the pilgrims when they started the Plymouth Plantation, all right? The Plymouth uh, work over there. So he was connected to William Bradford still as friends. Roger Williams was so patient and he understood because the Lord sent him Quakers. Now Quakers, these guys were just quacks, okay? <laughs> so. Quakers are rightfully called quacks. You would think that they're the nice people, but during Roger Williams' time, they were the most controversial people. You know who wrote Fox's Book of Martyr? A Quaker. John Fox, he's a Quaker. But these Quakers, they were just such quacks because they thought that to be spiritual is where you cause a ruckus yeah. deliberately amongst fellow Christians. And because you cause a ruckus and they get mad at you, you must be suffering persecution for Jesus, you know? <laughs> now that sounds familiar, you know, that sounds like this, these weird rebels that we've seen, right, amongst Baptists. 
So there are independent Baptist people that act like such rogues and rebels that they practically become cultic, believe it or not. So they're rightfully called quacks. If you want to call them Quaker, that's fine, whatever. <laughs> but once Roger Williams took care of them, why did Quakers go to Roger Williams' territory, you think? Yeah, because he's crazy himself. So crazy people attract crazy people. What men learn from history is that men never learn from history. Did you ever notice that when uh, some pastor becomes crazy and rogue, that they attract crazy people too? And then they act all popish, and then they either repent and soften up, or they act popish and they act stupid, and then they cause even more splits. Uh-huh, right? You know what I mean? You know what I'm talking about? Okay, let that be a lesson. Anyways, you wouldn't believe... Uh, who he was close with, the Native tribes, the Native Americans. They became close with Roger Williams. As a matter of fact, when there were other uh, Native tribes that wanted to attack the colonists, the white colonists, he became friends with some of them that they would tell, they would tell the report ahead of time to Roger Williams, and Roger Williams was able to save his fellow colonists, the ones he gave trouble to at the beginning. So the Lord softened his heart a lot. So Roger Williams softened up. The Lord used him to minister to the, native tr uh, the natives. And as a matter of fact, some of them even got saved because of him and what he did for the Lord. So there's uh, one good thing that we could say about Roger Williams in that case. Now, all, everything that I've just told you is from uh, Richard Sowell's uh, audio called... Uh, um, American history from a biblical perspective. I would highly recommend that. Really great stuff. I'm glad they never uh, deleted that. That was from the 90s, okay? Now I'm going to tell you who gets the credit. John Clark. He's the guy that should be credited as the First Baptist Church. Now this source I'm going to read is How Satan Turned America Against God by William Grady. Now John Clark, in page 107... According to the best authorities, Dr. John Clark was born in Suffolk, England on October 3rd, 1609. His parents, Thomas and Rose, were devout Puritans. John received a quality education and later became a medical doctor. He was acclaimed by his contemporaries as scholar bred, a man bred to learning, and a learned physician. It is believed that his predilection for religious liberty led him to join the first church of the group Particular Baptists in London, formed in September 1633 by Mr. John Spilsbury, Professor J.C.C. Clark of Shirtleft College, said of his ancestor, doc, quote, Dr. Clark's connection with these Baptists is quite evident from his first day in Boston to the day of his death. When Dr. Clark, accompanied by his wife Elizabeth, arrived in Boston in November 1637, the intolerant city was beset by theological controversy. His biographer, Dr. Wilbur Nelson, states, like other suspected persons, he was disarmed. Uh, let's see right here. So Dr. Clark, he is credited for being or starting the first Baptist church because of this uh, epitaph or this inscription mentioned when, when he died. It mentions right here, this church was founded in 1639. That's what the inscription reads. And this is concerning, uh, let's see right here. This is concerning uh, John Clark himself with his church in Providence. Now, if it's in Providence, you know which state that is, Rhode Island. So Roger Williams, yes, he was, uh, he would meet John Clark at times. They knew each other. However, people have given the credit to Roger Williams when it actually should be John Clark because Roger Williams' connection with Baptists is unstable. A second thing I want to mention about John Clark and in future uh, people that I read, remember this. The reason why I disdain Calvinism so much is uh, this was a thorn on the side for Bible believers and Baptists because that doctrine somehow seeps in somewhere among the Baptist crowd or amongst the Bible believers. 
which is why I mentioned about Martin Luther, right? And we're going to see that later on with the Great Awakening Revivals with George Whitfield. And then we've seen this case with uh, John Clark. But I put this in recognition with the heroes of Bible believers. Unfortunately, however, that doctrine of Calvinism would taint within that Bible-believing line which is why I, ha I have a strong disdain toward it. So don't be surprised if some of these Bible-believing heroes that I read, that you're going to find out some of them had ties or dabbled with Calvinism in some way or form, which is why I mentioned to you about uh, three streams, right? So here's a Calvinist stream. Here's the Baptist stream right here. But then I mentioned an in-between stream, okay? So it goes like where their, their practices and their beliefs, you can see that they were Baptist, but then some of it was unfortunately with Calvinist, okay? Anyways, continuing on with uh, John Clark. So then he joined the particular Baptist. He is credited with the first Baptist church. Some things to know about him. How did he handle the Puritans? So you can see he was not a good Puritan. then. <laughs> he was not really a good Calvinist with these uh, uh, church state Puritans. What happened here is that while Dr. Clark was preaching from Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, two constables entered the private home, broke up the meeting, and executed warrants for their arrest on the grounds that they were erroneous persons being strangers. When Dr. Clark remonstrated in a calm manner, his antagonist replied, Come, shut up your book and go with us. We have come to apprehend you. As the three prisoners left the house, Pastor Clark encouraged his tearful host by making a timely application to his text. Quote, the hour of temptation and trial has come, but let us keep the word of his patience and he will sustain us in the time of trouble. Amen. End of quote. As there was no jail in Lynn, because remember, they were just starting their settlements, right? So they didn't really have a, 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 a successful, flourishing, built-up city yet. So it was just in the groundwork. So they didn't have a jail in Lynn. So the erroneous persons were taken to the local alehouse. After processing and a meal, the unthinkable occurred. Because it was still the Puritan Sabbath, with an average service lasting four hours, the busted Baptists were promptly hauled from the tavern to the congregational meeting house. Dr. C.E. Barrow writes, quote, the three men whose own worship had been broken up were now taken without their own consent to the meeting of the standing order. So joining uh, this other uh, church who, are, who was observing the Puritan Sabbath. Huh. All right, so, you know, to protest their disgraceful <laughs> predicament, the visitors refused to take off their hats. <laughs> Whereupon the constable removed them, you know but not in the most amiable manner, end of quote. When Dr. Clark tried to voice a respectful objection, he was curtly reminded that he and his companions were a captive audience. On Monday, the men were transferred to the jail in Boston among a slate of charges. The most ludicrous read, quote, for being taken by a constable at a pri private meeting on the Lord's Day. The heart of their complaint was as follows. For such things as shall be alleged against them, uh, so quote, for such things as shall be alleged against them concerning their seducing and drawing aside of others after their erroneous judgments and practices and for suspicion of having their hands in the rebaptizing of one or more among us. There it is. There it is, that Baptist distinctive, what the Anabaptists had. See, this guy's a Baptist. Doesn't sound very Calvinist, right? Doesn't sound very Calvinist, what John Calvin did back then. Anyways, 10 days after their imprisonment, the three Baptists were found guilty and fined accordingly. Clark, 20 pounds, Holmes, 30 pounds, and Crandall, 5 pounds. The men were also curtly informed that if they could not come up with the cash, they were to be well whipped in Jesus' name, of course. Wow, don't they sound like a bunch of Catholics? How about that? Makes you respect the uh, Puritan or Calvinist connection and mindset, right? 
Dr. Clark relates as follows, quote, None were able to turn to the law of God or man by which we were condemned. At length, the governor stepped up and told us we had denied infants' baptism and being somewhat transported, told me I had deserved death and said he would not have such trash brought into their jurisdiction. Doesn't that sound like a fine Christian? Puritan, holy people, right? But then the haughty Endicott slipped up by saying to Clark, quote, you go up and down and secretly insinuate into those that are weak, but you cannot maintain it before our ministers. You may try and dispute with them. Mm. Oh, that's a big mistake. Yeah, yeah. Remember the Anabaptists and the Baptist distinctive was they love to argue scripture. Sounds like a typical <laughs> Bible believer, right? The next morning, Dr. Clark sent shockwaves throughout the colony by accepting the challenge to debate while the distinguished theologians objected to the proposal, you know, like uh, Dr. Calvin is so-and-so, you know, I don't have time yeah. to do a debate because, because what? What? Oh, because I'm a theologian, I can't stoop that low. No, let's be honest, you're a coward, man. Anyway, while the distinguished theologians objected to the proposal, the kangaroo court had committed itself. Mm -hmm. Clark was thus informed that the disputation was granted and scheduled for the next week. Oh, so they did it. With the loathsome jail cell for his study, the man of God prepared four propositions which he intended to defend. Now, this is really, really good. Um, man, if I read this, I won't have time to go to the other parts. Do you guys want to hear what Dr. John Clark wrote in his four propositions? Yes? All right, then. So one is good enough. I don't hear a nay. So, all right. I won't be able to have much time to go to this other one. So um, we'll go through right here. The testimony. So here are his four propositions. The testimony of John Clark, a prisoner of Jesus Christ at Boston in the behalf of my Lord and of his people is as followeth. You know, <laughs> sounds, this guy tries to sound like Apostle Paul, you know, <laughs> typical Bible believer, you know. <laughs> First, I testify that Jesus of Nazareth, whom God hath raised from the dead, is made both Lord and Christ. This Jesus, I say, is the Christ, in English, the anointed one, and hath the name above every name. He is the anointed priest, none to or with whom in point of atonement. The anointed prophet, none to him in point of instruction. The anointed king, who is gone to his father for his glorious kingdom, and shall ere long return again. And that this Jesus Christ is also the Lord, none to or with him by way of commanding or ordering and ordering with respect to the worship of God. The household of faith, which being purchased with his blood as priest, instructed and nourished by his spirit as prophet, do wait in his appointment as he is the Lord in hope of that glorious kingdom, which shall ere long appear. Second. I testify that baptism or dipping into water is one of the commandments of this Lord Jesus Christ and that a visible believer or disciple of Christ that is one that manifests his repentance toward God and faith in Jesus Christ is the only person that is to be baptized or dipped with that. Vis no heresy. They'll, they'll, they'll fine you for that, brother, for not baptizing your, uh, your sprinkling your baby. Excuse me or dipping of Jesus Christ in water, and also that visible person that is to walk in the visible order of his house, and so to wait for his coming the second time in the form of a Lord and King with his glorious kingdom according to promise, and for his sending down in time of his absence the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit of promise, and all this according to the last will and testament of that living Lord, whose will is not to be added to or taken from. Thirdly, I testify or witness that every such believer in Christ Jesus that waiteth for, for his appearing may in point of liberty, yea, ought in point of duty to improve that talent his Lord hath given unto him. And the congregation may either ask for information to himself or if he can may speak by way of prophecy for the edification, exhortation and comfort of the whole. And now the congregation at all times upon all occasions and in all places as far as the jurisdiction of his Lord extends may, yea, ought to walk as a child of light, justifying wisdom with his ways and reproving folly with the unfruitful works thereof, provided all this be shown out of a good conversation as James speaks 
with meekness of wisdom. Fourth, finally, last, I testify that no such believer or servant of Jesus Christ hath any liberty, much less authority from his Lord to smite his fellow servant, yeah. nor yet with outward force or arm of flesh to constrain or restrain his conscience, or yet his outward man for conscience sake or worship of his God, where injury is not offered to the person, name, or estate of others. Yeah, amen. amen. <laughs> oh, he's preaching at them. Yeah. <laughs> Every man being such, the one that smites, yeah. as he shall appear before the judgment seat of Christ and must give account of himself to God and therefore ought to be fully persuaded in his own mind for what he undertakes because... Oh, this is convicting. Because he that doubteth is damned if he eat. And so also if he act, because he doth not eat or act in faith. And what is not a faith is sin. You know what he's done? He's convicted those constables if they are saved Christians. Imagine having the, that conscience bothering you when you go. <laughs> he gave them the book. William Grady writes, At any rate, as Dr. Clark's reputation had preceded him, the Puritan divines, the Puritan divines, <laughs> the Puritan divines chickened out, and the debate was indefinitely postponed. Clark was then surprised to learn that he was suddenly free to go. <laughs> what he didn't know was that some friends had paid the fine, securing his uh, discharge. All right, so that's uh, John Clark, actually. Now, I'm going to be reading a little bit more about him later, but let's come to Obadiah Holmes. Yeah, now, yeah. Obadiah Holmes is probably going to be the favorite Baptist hero during this time of the early Baptist. Now, Obadiah Holmes is as follows in page 113. In 1639, Holmes brought his wife and son to Salem, Massachusetts, where he established the first glass factory in America. However, when his Quaker business partner was prosecuted for a doctrinal matter, the wayward Holmes challenged the religious hierarchy, suffering excommunication and banishment in 1646 as a result. Now, this is important because what he was doing was, because back then he was a prodigal son. So he was brought up in the faith of his fathers, but he went wayward. He was prodigal. But after what happened to his friend, he got right with the Lord. Obadiah Holmes was born in Preston, Lancashire, England in 1606. He was thoroughly grounded in religion and educated at Oxford University. Yet he chose to forsake the faith of his fathers for a worldly go good time. Then what happened was, he, uh, after his Quaker business partner got prosecuted for a doctrinal matter, Holmes started to study his Bible finally. And when you do know this, church, when you start studying the truth, then you wake up out of that worldly lifestyle. Anyway, he then moved to the more liberal Plymouth colony where he had a providential encounter with Dr. Clark. So how about that? You notice how these Baptists are hanging around with pilgrims? You know, so that's, that's why their foundation is so important because that's where the Baptist heritage was able to come out more. Holmes and eight fellow dissenters were subsequently baptized by Clark. When plans for a new church were prescribed by local officials, Holmes relocated to Newport and united with Dr. Clark's work. So Obadiah Holmes joined Dr. Clark's ministry, actually. Now, I'm going to come how... Ro now, Roger Williams is also connected to these guys, but I'll come to that a little later. But John Clark is probably the most important character who ties the Baptist, okay? You remember when they arrested John Clark and three men? The third man was Obadiah Holmes. John Clark was able to go away free, but not Obadiah Holmes, actually. Obadiah Holmes, it is said that right here, page 115, when a, uh, the, men were in, uh, the men were also curtly informed that if they could come could not come up with the cash, which is the fine, remember? They were to be well whipped in Jesus' name, of course. When Holmes replied, Obadiah Holmes replied, I bless God, I am counted worthy to suffer for the name of Jesus. 
the Reverend John Wilson lost it and struck the defendant saying, the curse of God go with thee. Oh, fine Christians, right? Yeah, fine Christians. So Clark was able to be free, but Grady writes on page 117, in the sovereign plan of God, Obadiah Holmes, Clark's future successor at Newport, was ordained to, be the, to become, listen up, this is important, the esteemed proto-martyr of American Baptists. Brother Holmes would shed the first blood on this soil, America, for the lovely Lord Jesus. That's why he's a very important character. When Holmes learned that the brethren had also raised the money for his fine, we're going to get you out like John Clark. You know what he said? He graciously declined their generosity, though publicly declaring in the spirit of the Apostle Paul at Philippi, Acts 16, 37, quote, having committed no crime, I will not permit my friends to pay a single farthing for me, end of quote. Likewise, on the day of his ordeal, September 5th, 1651, he followed his Savior's example, Matthew 27, 34, by refusing a cup of Madeira wine, stating, quote, No, let me so suffer that if I am sustained, God shall have the glory. Do you understand what he meant by that? So he was offered, like Jesus Christ, that, uh, that alcoholic, uh, that wine, where it can numb the pain. Yeah. But he refused it. He refused it and said, No, I want to... Uh, if I'm able to bear the pain, then that's evidence of God's power. God gets the glory. That's what he basically said. This is something, church. With his New Testament in hand, he calmly approached the dreaded whipping post located behind the old state house. A typical Bible believer, you know. <laughs> when he was being disrobed, this is how the story goes. Unbutton here, said the executioner, as he gave his jacket a jerk. No, said Holmes, I make as much conscience of unbuttoning one button as I do of paying the sentence of 30 pounds. I will do nothing towards executing such an unjust law. What a stubborn guy, man. <laughs> Faithful to his word, he would not voluntarily assist the executioner in the least in removing his garments from his back. He was as helpless as if he were asleep and the executioner had to handle him as though he were a statue. <laughs> this is what the Baptist minister said. The Lord, having manifested his love towards me in giving me repentance towards God and faith in Christ, and so to be baptized in water by a messenger of Jesus in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That really sounds like a Baptist, right? <laughs> Wherein I have fellowship with him in his death, burial, and resurrection, I am now come to be baptized in afflictions by your hands, that so I may further fellowship with my Lord and am not ashamed of his sufferings, Amen. for by his stripes am I healed. Wow. The executioner removed enough of his garments and having fastened him to the post, seized a three-quartered whip and proceeded to apply the blows in an unmerciful manner. You know what he said, Obadiah Holmes? As the strokes fell upon me, I had such a spiritual manifestation of God's presence as the like thereof I had never had, nor felt, nor can with fleshly tongue express. And the outward pain was so removed from me that indeed I am not able to declare it to you. It was so easy to me that I could well bear it. Yea, and in a manner felt it not. Although it was grievous, as the spectator said, the man striking with all his strength, yea, spitting in his hands three times, as many affirmed, good Calvinist, good Puritan, you, good Congregationalist, with a three-corded whip, giving me therewith thirty strokes, when he had loosed me from the post, having joyfulness in my heart and cheerfulness in my countenance, as the spectators observed, I told the magistrates, you have struck me as with roses. Mm, yeah. Although the Lord, so what happened was Holmes, he didn't feel that pain. And he just told the magistrates and those people, you struck me as with roses. And then after that, when he went home, 
That's when he felt the pain, actually. That was proof that God's hand was on him to show to the world that if I can bear the pain, then it will be proof of the Lord's glory. So that's Obadiah Holmes. Now to tell you about this important connection. Now this is very important. Remember, they have to have some charter going with England. So how John Clark was able to connect with Roger Williams and Obadiah Holmes is as follows. This is by page 118 from William Grady. This is called the Charter of uh, 1663, all right, which you all want to know. What happened is they're in danger of losing that uh, land of the free because of the charter issues with England. So John Clark was heavily involved in that. Believe it or not, Roger Williams is accredited with that. Again, but it should be John Clark. This is page 118. But now, by now, it should be obvious that Rhode Island's Christian neighbors were a few bricks shy of a load. Between 1647 and 1692, at least 23 females would be executed throughout New England as witches or seditious heretics. So we'll come to that later. That's the infamous Salem witch trials, but we'll come to that later. Consequently, the religious toleration exhibited in Rhode Island was a continual source of irritation or conviction to the self-righteous Puritans of Massachusetts Bay. Yeah, no kidding. Every imaginable invective was heaped upon the tiny Baptist outposts from, they were called Rogues Island, and they were also, their place was also called the Sewer of New England. Yeah, doesn't that sound like your typical modern holy Calvinist today who are so pure as Puritan divines and giving, and you know, what they call these Baptists? Yeah. Anyways. However, although conditions appear threatening on the home front, Dr. Clark was wise enough to discern that the greater danger was back in England. What happened was this. Nelson writes as follows. Massachusetts and Connecticut also had their agents in England and pressed some of their claims with a view to disintegrating the colony of the Providence Plantations. They proposed to make a tripartite division of her territory that the Narragansett County should be absorbed by Connecticut and that Massachusetts should appropriate Providence and Warwick, while to Plymouth should fall the island towns. While Roger Williams had obtained the colony's original charter from Charles I in 1644, so you might recall Charles I, okay? I mentioned about that history of the Thirty Years' War with Oliver Cromwell and then Charles and other people coming out after that. So let's go back to England that time. The king's execution five years later rendered the agreement tenuous at best. Okay, we got a problem right here now with their charter. The citizens of Portsmouth and Newport subsequently petitioned Dr. Clark to go to England to monitor their affairs. He readily consented and sailed in November 1651, leaving a recovering Holmes, Obadiah Holmes, in charge of his flock. So... So it was painfully pastoring the church. Maybe that could stir up some of you people when pastors away, you know, and then that can uh, be a good role model for you, Obadiah Holmes. Although Williams also went along, Roger Williams went along with John Clark, being appointed by the smaller Providence colony, he returned in 1654. While Clark continued his lobby on behalf of Rhode Island for another decade, these skills were put to the test when Charles II restored the monarchy in 1660. The charter, which had been granted Williams, Roger Williams, by the Earl of Warwick, was promptly canceled. Okay, they're in trouble, okay? The Baptists are going to be in trouble. The new autocrat was prejudiced against the liberal colony. Though confronted with insurmountable obstacles, Clark did have two things going for him. Jehovah's plan for Israel's recovery and the promises of Holy Scripture. And you're going to see that later on if you study other historical parts. But I'm not going to explain that part. Okay, what happens here is that Dr. Clark, he obtained the signature and seal of the king on July 8, 1663. So democratic, both in letter and spirit, that doubts were voiced in England as to whether the king even had a right to grant it. 
So obviously enemies would attack this. It's not authentic, it's not legitimate, but Thomas Bicknell says the following. The Charter of Rhode Island 16, of 1663 has been universally recognized as the most liberal state paper ever issued by the English crown. <coughs> With regard to how Charles received the Baptist preacher's bold request, John Christian writes as follows, quote, The king replied benignantly, saying that he would permit the colonists to, con to continue in the enjoyment of their liberty and that he would not allow them to be compelled to submit themselves to the Church of England. Wow. That is huge, guys. I don't, not even the pilgrims got that. You know, going back to Richard Sowell's source, the pilgrims, they're able to get the charter because of the people who took care of their charter in England. And guess who they were? Puritans or part of Anglican, somehow tied. So, you know, Roger Williams complained about that. So he said, you should repent for doing that. You can see his society was not very ideal. He's not a very good diplomat. You should repent for doing that. Well, that's great. Uh, Richard Sowell, I think he said it this way. Well, that's very good preaching, but that's not very good practice or something like that. <laughs> that was pretty funny. So Roger Williams, you see right here that he was uh, rebuking anybody, including pilgrims, about their connection with Anglican Church in any way or form or the Puritans. But this statement right here is where the Church of England will not compel them, will not compel them to submit to its power and authority. That's extremely huge church that was the lord if if you don't see god's hand behind all of this how america was starting you are totally blind there's no doubt god's hand was behind this uh, when he started this nation so it's incredible it's amazing the document is read as follows quote that our royal will and pleasure is that no person within the said colony at any time hereafter shall be in any way molested, punished, or called in question for any differences in opinion in matters of religion. Wow. Well, I bet you uh, the Puritan divines were very happy to hear that yeah. of how they were persecuting their fellow Baptists. And do not actually disturb the civil peace of our said colony but that all and every person or persons may from time to time and at all times hereafter freely and fully have and enjoy his and their own judgments and consciences in matters of religious concernment. That is a Baptist mentality. Don't you see why Luther, he's similar along that line? He was against the Catholic Empire because he said, my conscience is bound to the dictates of the Bible and no man should be in control over my conscience. That's a Baptist thing. That's a Baptist foundation. William Grady writes right here, we should not be surprised to discover that the landmark, which is called the Charter of Rhode Island and Providence Plantations, July 8, 1663, was granted by King Charles II to Roger Williams. Again, he gets all the credit falsely again. However, the original document kept in a fireproof safe in the office of the Secretary of State in the Rhode Island State House tells a different story altogether. The opening lines of the charter read as follows. Charles II, by the grace of God, King of England, Scotland, etc., to all to whom these presents shall come greeting. Whereas we have been informed by the humble petition of our trusty and well-beloved subject, John Clark, on behalf of then the 23 names with Roger Williams. See, John Clark should get all the credit. This is interesting by William Grady. He said this, page 122. While James I, though remembered for the AV 1611, is also credited with shedding the last Baptist blood in England, it was a propose that his grandson, Charles II, acquiesced to the pastor of the one who shed the first Baptist blood. 
in America. Amen. Yeah, that's a real great story, amen? That's a real great story. So that's the Charter of 1663. Okay, what I'm going to do, that way I can squeeze in the time, is talk to you about these two things, because I've given the verse in Revelation. Then I'll come to here. So notice at the beginnings, the Lord was mightily using it. And obviously, the pilgrims and the colonists, they were becoming prosperous. What happened is this, though. The tribal chief who made peace with the pilgrims, his son who later, uh, when the father passed away and then the son came to the scene, the white men called him Philip. And Philip was not in good terms with those white colonists. As a matter of fact, this is very important. Richard Sowell, this is all taken from Richard Sowell's work, as well as you can confirm with several historical sources if uh, my explanations match up, okay? But... Because of prosperity, that's why the white colonists, they were suffering. And in Revelation 3, when you're prosperous, what will the Lord do? He's going to rebuke you. Now check this out. There's no doubt God's hand is behind this and God's judgment. This is very crazy. So Philip got upset. So he tried to stir up all the fellow native tribes. Now remember, they're all in competition with each other. They're not in friendly terms. But because of the white colonists increasing and taking over more territory, Philip was trying to get all the other native tribes to turn against the, the colonists. What happened was, is that there were, uh, Philip sent in three agents to make sure to go in amongst the fellow Christians, the white Christians, and then to try to read them out beyond friendly terms and then to start a ruckus, to start something. However, this is pretty crazy. This brother is known to always be a sober, serious person. He was full with prayer and Bible reading, and he just got up from that. So when he got up and then he talked to those natives, those natives got scared. They said, our plan has been found out. But it's because, he's, uh, it's because he's a, he just read his Bible. He was just a serious mood that day. That's all. But the Lord used that to uh, get them brainwashed, to get them to get thinking, oh man, he found out our plan. So then Philip is like, how do you find out about our plans? You know what they also said? Those natives said, it's that book he was reading. That book told him about our plan. <laughs> so then Phillips, he was trying to go around and then start something. And then what happened after that was war broke out. And this is where the liberals take advantage of it. You know, they'll take advantage of oh, the white colonists wiping out the poor native tribes. You know what it is? This is very simple. In war, all sides, when it comes to prosperity, money, and everything, there is problems and errors on both sides. You just like to pick a certain color, okay, or group. You don't want to talk about every person's sin. So what happened was war broke out, and unfortunately, both the white colonists as well as the natives, they had problems with each other. Both of them had a sin issue in war, you're going to find something ugly and bad things occurred and happened. Now, this is strange, though. What happened was, as the killing was going on, there were some natives who actually told other, uh, uh, who told their soldiers to not go to this certain territory because God was with them. Isn't that, isn't that similar to the Philistines, how they feared the Jews when the Jews were backslidden, not right with God either? And they were sinning, but the Philistines feared their God and said, the ark of God is in the camp. See, it's a lot of, a lot of matchup. What men learn from history is that men never learn from history. You see history repeating itself. Anyways, what happened is finally the Christians were finally getting themselves right with God. Why is this happening? Why are we going through all this hardship? And it's usually, Richard Sowell said this, it's always usually during suffering you finally turn to the Lord. And you get your eyes open. And they said it's because of our sins. We were too comfortable with prosperity. We're not serving God like we should. We got to get right with God, church, Bible reading, stuff like that. So they start to recommit themselves to the Lord. And what happened after that was they finally caught Phillips. And then finally the war had ended after that. However, like the nation of Israel, they'll repent. Then they get prosperous and repeat a cycle, right? So what happened was the cycle kept repeating and thus comes 
the infamous Salem witch trials. Now, isn't it amazing? They give so much detail on this, but there's plenty of details where you can go to the uh, back in the beginning. The beginning is what you want to hear, not jump to decades later and what happened right here, you know? So that's the silly thing with the liberals. So they were in the wrong, and yeah, you see the Puritan mindset involved again. They're the poison. They've always been the poison. That's the problem with this church-state thing. That's right. A church-state thing where it causes so much problems. As a matter of fact, even preachers were speaking out against the Salem witch trial, and they said, uh, one preacher actually said, it's better that 10 witches uh, would, be, uh, would survive rather than killing one innocent man. So believe it or not, where you get your criminal law system today about, about uh, when criminals are found guilty, that they make sure that the prosecution has really good evidence on that because the worst thing is condemning an innocent man. Yeah. Remember the, the mindset of the Inquisition? Oh, yeah. Catholic in Inquisition was what? You're automatically guilty until proven innocent. But in this law system, it's innocent until proven guilty. So notice that uh, Americans should give a lot of credence to the preachers, you know, but they just don't want to tell you that, you know. So anyway, the Salem witch trials, this is how it happened. What happened was it, there was strange stuff going on. Richard Sow mentioned, and a lot of the historians don't tell this, but as prosperity was growing, there were witches also prospering, moving there and you know, as they were prospering more and more, it started out with buying certain animal parts. Then after that, really weird stuff was going on, like putting, uh, you know, some kind of uh, potions, curses, spells. Church steeples were getting lightning struck upon. So this was getting a little bit fearful. So that's from Richard Sowell's source right there. The common source you're going to hear, which everyone's pretty much going to agree with that they have to tell you, is it started with, uh, with three girls, little girls, and then one of them had some kind of weird spasm going on that even scientists and people don't have an explanation for. They don't want to say demon possession, obviously, okay? But this girl had some kind of weird moments and then speaking stuff, convulsing like you thought you were watching The Exorcist. So that's probably where the director of the Exorcist got the idea from. But what happened with that girl, then there were other girls involved in that. Then there's like a mob mentality involved. But that's the problem also with Christian churches is this gossiping. Okay? What men learn from history is that men never learn from history. And when you combine with church state, it's even worse. What happened was is that then people start to find... Uh, to find out who's the one involved. And they found out that the girls, that they were involved with one of the Caribbean slaves. Now, if you know what's in the Caribbean, that's where witchcraft is rampant. And that woman actually talked about yeah, the devil is actually here in the mist. So that put even more uh, shockwaves and fear amongst the people. So a mob mentality took over. And then they did the most ridiculous things where you know, if you're really a witch or not, then you're going to survive drowning in the water. Well, I guess if you're innocent then, then you would drown and die in the water, right? So it's so ridiculous how they would test out if you're really a witch or not. But this was very similar, you can see, with the Inquisition. How they would test out if you're really a witch or not, and then they burn these people at the stake. It's about 20, if not less than 20, innocent people and a lot of women were burnt and they died. And that's the infamous Salem witch trials. So what happened right there? That's a result of a church state in yeah. mentality, yeah. a Calvinist influence that was always there, and th uh, thirdly, thirdly, prosperity. So then, while America was at its dark points with the King Philip's War Salem witch trials, they needed not just getting right with God, not just a revival. They needed a big-time revival. And, if, and they were in trouble because the Enlightenment was infecting France. And that French Enlightenment, where Voltaire and a lot of other people, this, where atheism, communism, all this start to spread out, it was becoming chaos. In the Enlightenment, with, the, with this horrible apostasy going on, the Lord had to send something. Yeah. 
It began with a born preacher who preached sinners in the hands of an angry God as if they were dropping into hell. Then a person who started to make hymns and songs started to get involved in America. He wrote, Arise, my soul, arise. And can it be Charles Wesley? John Wesley came, who founded the Methodist Church, and then a booming preacher whose voice was, can be heard a mile long. We shall come to these people. All right, next history lesson. God, my Father, I want to thank you so much for uh, your word and for uh, this lesson in history. I pray that we will learn from it and that we will apply the concepts and not repeat the wrong patterns of our ancestors. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.